So, so I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, I'll give you just one example. Um, I handed Dorian Nakamoto 50 Bitcoin. Um, I haven't slept very well since then because I spent two hours teaching him how to do basic security and he doesn't know how to use an internet web browser. He's definitely not Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> no question about that. If you've ever tried to teach your grandma how to use a web browser, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, this, is a, this is someone who comes from the previous generation of computing, mainframe computing. Um, not the internet generation, does not know any of the browser paradigms, design paradigms, navigation paradigms. Like for example, the, the things that are underlined are clickable. Just simple things, right? Um, so how do you teach someone like that how to do basic Bitcoin security? Very, very difficult, right? But we can use hardware devices to store Okay, so let's talk about how we, how we get around this. Uh, we're basically going to see a couple of different ways we get around this. The first one is we're going to see the implementation of uh, root of trust hardware platform modules, whether those are hardware wallets or they're trusted platform modules built into devices. Uh, so, for example, a TPM on a laptop that stores the keys, runs the cryptographically secure uh, pseudo-random number generator, and does transaction signing and elliptic curve uh, operations right on the chip, tamper-proof chip built in. Um, if the keys never leave that chip, that chip can be secured. So you basically have, within the general purpose operating system, you have a trusted root, a hardware device inside, uh, which does key storage and transaction signing. And then you just send it a transaction, and it will prompt you for a token or a fingerprint swipe or something like that. And when it does that, it's completely bypassing the operating system. So it's using the hardware display to overlay something. It's taking hardware keyboard or hardware fingerprint scanner without involving the operating system at all. An alternative is pure hardware devices like uh, Trezor or other hardware wallets like that, which basically do Bitcoin operations on the device a little LED screen, maybe a little ping keypad, etc. So there are going to be devices like that, um, hardware wallets, to make Bitcoin usable by uh, regular people. What's really promising is the capabilities around multisig. So what you could do with multisig is you can introduce risk management and arbitration through the use of an additional signature. <coughs> So when you hear people say that Bitcoin transactions are not reversible or that you have no recourse, that's not actually true. With multisig, uh, you can make transactions under escrow that are reversible effectively, uh, and you can introduce recourse. So this is the way I try to describe it. If you do a transaction on the PayPal system, PayPal is your arbitration provider. If something goes wrong, PayPal is the recourse you have but only PayPal, and only by their rules. And if you do a transaction on Visa, and something goes wrong, you can call Visa, and they will give you recourse. But only Visa on the Visa network. <coughs> so in the traditional world, when you choose the payment system, you choose the arbitration provider, and you choose the rules of arbitration that go with that provider, and you don't have another choice. With Bitcoin, you can actually introduce arbitration providers into each transaction on a case-by-case -case basis, and make a choice. Let's say, for example, you want to do a real estate transaction. You could agree with the other party to introduce an arbitration provider who does escrow for that transaction. And, does, uh, and you would pick someone who is a real estate expert. Uh, you would pick someone who has good reviews as an arbitration provider. Um, and then that person or institution or algorithm could provide escrow services for you for that particular transaction. If you're doing a transaction that involves purchasing antiques <laughs> or art, you might have an arbitration provider who has experience with Sotheby's auctions and art appraisal. Uh, if you do a transaction that involves international shipping, you might involve an arbitration provider that, that does import-export businesses, shipping, and uh, transportation insurance services. So what that means is that with multisig and the ability to introduce an arbitration provider of your choice, um, you open up an entire market for arbitration providers, and you can pick and choose from that market. 
you don't have to pick just one. You can have multiple arbitration providers and you can have backups between them. Uh, and with that, you can also have, on a per transaction basis, you can introduce someone to do just risk management. Uh, that's something that Green Address is doing, that CryptoPort is doing, and a bunch of other uh, companies are now developing around multisig. The idea basically is that you have a wallet um, and a set of addresses that are always by definition multisig. You put your funds in there, and then every time you try to spend something, it requires two signatures. One from you, and one from your risk management provider. And what your risk management provider is going to do is, is they're going to look at the transaction you're trying to sign, and they're going to evaluate how risky that transaction is. They're going to look at how big an amount it is, what percentage of your total balance it is, uh, what the destination address is, whether it's a known merchant or a payment poster like BitPay, or whether it's a completely unknown address, or worse, one that has been identified as being involved in phishing attempts. Um, and then they'll call you, they'll text you. You'll get a phone call that says, you are trying to spend $100 <laughs> <to> <laughs> thieves are us. <laughs> to approve this transaction, press 1. <laughs> to cancel this transaction, press 2. And so you can easily manage that risk. So that's something we're going to see being developed in, in the Bitcoin space now. The way to look at this is really interesting. You're going, you're, the way to look at this is we're reintroducing <coughs> the recourse capabilities, the arbitration capabilities, the escrow capabilities, and the risk management capabilities of traditional <coughs> financial services environments. But we're doing them in a market-based way, where the choice of provider is completely independent of the payment network and can be done as a negotiation at the point of the transaction creation, on a per-transaction basis, custom to the type of transaction you are trying to do, from a wide open market of providers of these services. And you can do it programmatically, which means we are going to have a lot more flexibility to do schemes that are less centralized, less uh, controlled by big monopolies, and more flexible to address the needs. So multi-sig is huge. Here's the thing. Multisig was first introduced as a technical proposal in November of 2012. It was first introduced uh, with the soft fork in November of 2013, and that's when transactions started being mined that supported multisig. And we are now four months from the moment it was introduced. Now, the fact that in four months there are half a dozen companies working on this, and every single major wallet is working on this, is nothing short of miraculous. In financial services, an innovation like that would take ten years to roll through all of the infrastructure. We're doing in four months what it would take a decade to do in financial services. And you're already seeing providers like Green Address and CryptoCorp and BitGo and others do it. Um, part of the reason it took so long is because if you start doing multi-sig on a large scale, you can't do it with non-deterministic addresses. It gets too complex to manage. What I mean by non-deterministic addresses, that means if you generate private keys through a roll of the dice, by randomly generating a private key each time, then keeping sync between the keys you are generating for part of the multi-sig and the keys somebody else is generating for part of the multi-sig, and then managing all of these keys uh, becomes very difficult. Multi-sig actually encourages the one address per transaction or one key pair per transaction mentality in Bitcoin. So now the number of addresses you have to manage and the number of key pairs you have to manage explodes <coughs> once you start doing multi-sig. And because you're not just managing it for one signature, but you're managing it for two or three different signatures, so you've got three times the number of addresses per transaction, and you're doing a second one per transaction or three separate ones per transaction. There's no way to do that with random roles. So you've seen two things move in parallel. One is multisig, and the other one is hierarchical deterministic wallets, BIP0032 tree-based wallets. And what these allow you to do is, from a common seed, generate billions of uh, key pairs that are all predictable, and then have a specific structure within them that allows you to quickly identify which key pair is used for which transaction, regenerate that, and use it to sign a transaction. 
So both of those have been moving in parallel. Hierarchical deterministic wallets are absolutely fascinating. Um, you can do essentially a tree which has a, a root node and then below it 32 bits of address space on the first level. That's four billion branches on the first level, followed by four billion branches per branch on the second level, followed by four billion branches on the third level. So the easiest thing you can do in a hierarchical deterministic wallet is get lost. Okay. If you don't know where you are on the tree, there's no way you're going to find your way back to that. So what's been happening over the last four months is a really broad discussion among the makers of hardware wallets like Trezor, um, software wallets like Multibit, Armory, and things like that, and web wallets like Green Address, BitGo, including blockchain and many others on how you structure the internal path of a BIP32 address so that you can predictably recreate them. So, which branch of the tree is used for uh, private signing keys, which one is used for creating change addresses, which one is used for doing multi-sig transactions, which one is used for doing Bitcoin, which one is used for doing Litecoin, for example, so you can have a common seed across currencies. All of that work is now coming to fruition, so you're going to see a lot of things happen in the next couple of months. Uh, pretty much every company in the space is working full speed to do that. So that was a very long answer on security and multi-sig and hierarchical wallets, but things are getting a lot better. If you look at the problems we have in Bitcoin with security, there's two ways to look at them. One is, this will never work and never go mainstream. And to those who think that, I will tell them that in 1992, I sent email using Unix command line skills, and it took two days to cross the internet. And there was no way my mom was going to do that, <laughs> right? But it happened. And I remember when doing a search on Archie, it took all day, and you couldn't find anything on the internet. And if you if you go back long enough, you're going to find articles in Wired magazine that said the internet will fail because we'll never be able to search and find anything. So those who see those as problems are missing the point. The point is that you take that problem and you solve it. You've got a $10 billion industry. You've got the next Google. Right? You solve search. You solve email. You've got the next Gmail. So what we should be thinking about is, if you have a problem in Bitcoin security, and you solve it with hardware wallets, that's a billion dollar industry. If you solve it with hierarchical deterministic wallets, that's a billion dollar industry. If you solve multi-sig, that's a billion dollar industry. If you solve arbitrage, escrow, and risk management services in an open market, and create a marketplace for those services. That's a, that's a hundred billion dollar industry, right there. So there are opportunities for entrepreneurs to solve these problems now. Uh, they're not just problems. That's, that's going to be a rather long answer, too. This is, this is one of the fundamental issues or compromises or design decisions that anyone has to make if they're trying to develop uh, innovation in uh, blockchain technologies, which is you have a Bitcoin blockchain with, I don't know, is it 10 petahashes now? I don't remember what it is right now. Maybe I'll use the zero block application my company makes to look that up. But, um, you, you have 10 petahashes say, of hashing power on Bitcoin. And then you've got a fraction of that on alternative chains like Doge, Lite, Peer, Prime, whatever. If you're building a new uh, blockchain technology, then the fundamental problem you have is you either have to find a way to squeeze your functionality inside the Bitcoin blockchain and take advantage of its hashing power, or you have to create something compelling enough to attract miners and then bootstrap your own hashing power fast enough before someone comes in with an ASIC and stomps on you. If you do a CPU friendly uh, blockchain technology today and try to bootstrap an altcoin on a CPU friendly technology, I'm going to go and take rent a botnet for a day with 15 million machines and I'm going to take over your altchain in 5 minutes. Right? and you just lost your alt chain. It's very easy to do. If you decide that's going to be too easy to do, and you make a uh, SHA-256 friendly alt chain, 
You're going to boot your nice brand new baby little oil chain, and I'm going to dump a terror hash ASIC on you and take it home, right? And so now I own your oil chain that way. So you're squeezed between two alternatives that are both of which are really terrible, right? It's very difficult to boot, boot an oil chain now to a level that's sustainable that cannot be hacked easily, even by one person, let alone a coalition of a couple of hackers or a couple of ASIC miners. So this is going to be the fundamental compromise. How do you design features? Uh, so at the moment there are three answers to that. Answer number one is you use a layered protocol on top of Bitcoin and you take advantage of Bitcoin's hashing power. Answer number two is you can create a compelling alt chain and you bootstrap it as fast as you can and hope that no one 51 percents you while you're booting it. And answer number three is you create a Turing complete platform for building chains called Ethereum and you build everything on top of that. And the advantage of that is you get your chain implementation, but you share mining with everybody else's chain implementation. So what you're doing is you're running a contract. I think Ethereum is actually one of the great answers. I think the overlay protocols, Mastercoin, Counterparty, uh, etc., are a great answer. I think the build your own alt chain is going to become non-viable. So the way to think about it is this. Think about the overlay protocols as HTTP. Uh, if you want to develop new functionality on top of the internet, <coughs> you do not invent a transport protocol. You write over HTTP or TCP, or you write over a peer-to-peer -peer protocol like BitTorrent. Just a bit. you use the fundamental building blocks, and then you layer it on top of something that already works well, and you take advantage of that network effect. Uh, nobody goes out and implements a completely new transport protocol uh, because it's infeasible, because it cannot scale effectively. So I think we're not going to see many alt chains coming out. We're going to see most of those layered protocols. Here's the other thing to think about. A lot of people are worried about what happens with Bitcoin and whether uh, groups that are powerful can come together and alter the course of Bitcoin and turn it into some kind of PayPal-like version, and introduce features nobody wants, and subvert the protocol, right? hijack the core Bitcoin protocol and subvert it. Um, I don't worry about that. I worry about the exact opposite, which is, if you look at the Bitcoin consensus mechanism today, in order to achieve consensus for a hard fork, not a soft fork, but a hard fork, you need to get massive support from the miners, both independent miners and mining pools. But that's not enough. You also need to get support from merchant processing gateways, because if they're not processing the merchant transactions on the new fork, and they stay on the old fork, then even if the miners move, they're mining empty blocks. You also need to get the support of the web wallet companies like Blockchain, uh, and the big exchanges and brokers like Coinbase, and bits them. Because if you don't, once again, the miners all move, and now they're mining empty blocks. And you have to get the support of the users, and you have to get the support of the hardware manufacturers that are coming along, like Trezor and, and others who are making hardware implementations of the core protocol. So, in order to actually do a hard fork in Bitcoin, we've gone from persuading the miners to persuading five constituencies that all have power of consensus. And if you know anything about democracy, uh, you'll know that it's going to become very, very difficult to achieve consensus on that scale on major changes. So what I anticipate we're going to see over the next year or two years is gradually the rate at which major changes to the protocol in Bitcoin can happen will slow down until within a couple of years the core Bitcoin functionality will freeze and we'll, we will not be able to make any more changes. <coughs> this is exactly what happened to IPv4. It got to a point where enough hardware was implementing IPv4 and distributed in millions of routers, and millions of edge devices, and millions of custom devices that were connected to the network, but implemented the IP stack, that you could not roll out new versions of the protocol. And as a result, even IPv6 is almost impossible to deploy. It's taken us 16 years 
and we'd rather do kludgy patches to IPv4 like NAT and CIDR and things like that because we can't get to the next version. Uh, essentially, the protocol ossified. Right? It got big enough, good enough, early enough, and then it stops evolving. You cannot introduce more evolution because there's too much embedded hardware and too much network effect. That's going to happen to Bitcoin in the next two years, in my opinion. The core Bitcoin protocol is going to stabilize in whatever state it is, whether we like it or not, whether it's ready or not. And then we won't be able to make any major changes. Uh, I think we need to get some of the anonymity issues done right before then. Uh, some of the fun fungibility and scalability issues done before then, because we will not have a chance afterwards. In the next two years, we will have the protocol for Bitcoin that will be with us for the next three or four decades. So think about that for a second. That's a much bigger risk than someone hijacking the protocol, rather the fact that we can't, we won't be able to change it. So what happens then? Exactly what happened with IP. Most of the innovation moves to layers above the core protocol. The core protocol stabilizes and freezes into a state where it supports the basic functions like TCP/IP has. And then you have a layered protocol on top, just like HTTP, which opens the door for introducing layers of innovation above the core protocol. So counterparty and master coins serve the purpose of HTTP. They allow us to move the innovation up one layer, freeze the basic address and transport layer in Bitcoin, the, the core transaction fungibility layer, freeze that, and then move the innovation up one layer, where you can have a lot more flexibility. Until eventually, that layer freezes too. HTTP is basically frozen on the internet too, more or less. Uh, and increasingly, even HTML is getting difficult to, to operate. Right? And this is the history of computer science. This is the history of computer science since the beginning. As layers get abstracted and you build things above them, the interfaces that point down make it very difficult to change the layers underneath because they affect too many things on the northbound side. And so those layers freeze, and you build another layer on top. We're going to see that evolution happening in Bitcoin. So I expect the development of Ethereum as a platform that's a bit more flexible, working in parallel with Bitcoin as a currency, as well as the secondary layers, counterparty, master coin, and whatever comes next, will give us the way to develop all of the innovation we need. Because all chains on their own cannot stand. You need a very compelling reason to mine an alt chain. <laughs>